This is a beginner's guide for RimWorld, and if you've never played this game before, you're probably going to need a beginner's guide. Now, i played this game for a lot of time, and I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know in order to get started, and a lot of advice and tips and things that you should know about as a new player coming into this if you've never played this game before. Also, this game's amazing. If you haven't played it, you should go buy it. So, real quick, just really quick options. You can go through uh, general options here, uh, auto save intervals, uh, have it run in the background or not, so it'll pause the game when minimized. Uh, development mode is something you wouldn't deal with as a beginner. Change resolution, stuff like that. Gameplay, the only thing in here is make sure this this one, make sure it is higher than zero or set, like, honestly, five is why it can't go to zero, but set it to five. You'll never actually do it as a new player, but having the potential is something you don't want to miss out on. You have multiple colonies, but that's something you'll learn way later in the game if you keep playing this game long enough. Uh, other than that, nothing's really too crazy in here. This stuff right here, you just ignore it. It's mainly for people who don't play the game through Steam. All right, so that's all that stuff real fast. Wanted to get through that. Uh, so we got new colony, load game. That's really all you're going to be using unless you want to do mods. Mods are a huge part of this game, but as a new player, don't worry about it. My biggest recommendation as a new player to RimWorld, don't buy the DLCs, don't buy anything. Just buy the base game and play because the DLCs are kind of more for veteran players because they just make the game even more complicated. And this game's already very complicated as a baseline. So uh, let's go into it as a just vanilla RimWorld experience. And let me explain. So you hit new colony to start and you're presented with some options. So, I mean, if you have mods, you'll mind more options. But anyway, uh, so you'll go into these different options. There's Crash Landed, which is the most generic way to play. It's you, well, not really you, but three colonists that you control, uh, and you start with all this stuff. Uh, and then you'll, your technology level is kind of, you know, medium. Uh, Lost Tribe is five people, but you start with almost no technology. You research technology slower. And uh, you're basically just like tribal people who were already on this rim world and you didn't crash land as some spacefaring people or anything. You're just primitive tribals who don't know anything. You start the stuff and try to work your way up. It doesn't stop you from getting anywhere though. I and mean, you research slower, but you could get all the way to getting into space and beating the game and stuff as a tribe. Uh, it's definitely doable. Uh, the Rich Explorer, this one's very fun for people who like to feel attached to a main character. Uh, this is one that I often pick. It's either this one or the one below it. Where, because the thing that happens is you start with one player. So this is the easy mode of starting with one player. Uh, so you'll start with one player and you have a bunch of tech. You'll start with a bunch of supplies and stuff. And it's just really good if you want to be attached to the character. Naked Brutality is super hard mode. You start with one character and you uh, don't have anything. You just, you crash landed. I mean, they have this little premise of you went for a surgery under anesthesia, woke up on some crash landed planet by yourself with nothing, naked, alone. Uh, so that's like the one for hardcore players that they do. Hardcore players usually pick Lost Tribe or Naked Brutality. If you're a new player, Crash Land or Rich Explorer is also good. But Lost Tribe could be good for a new player just because you start with no technology and you slowly get there, which could help you to work your way up to understanding how everything works. So it, it just depends. And if you want to get really crazy, you can go to the scenario editor, hit edit mode, and then you can change all sorts of variables and stuff. Change what you start with, change whatever. Uh, so... That's like an option, but realistically, if you're a new player, I would recommend Crash Landed because starting with one player is extremely dangerous because you could, if you get, like, if you don't know what you're doing, you could get sick or you could get injured and then you don't know how to heal yourself fast enough or know what to do and then you just die. With three people, you at least, if one or two people die to nonsense, you'll keep going. So ideally as a new player, you're going to pick this or Lost Tribe, but Crash Land is going to be your easiest one probably. So go hit next once you're ready. And now this is the storytellers that are in here by default. And obviously with mods and stuff, you can get different ones. Um, so there's some things you need to know. So Cassandra Classic is the very just standard way of playing the game. Events happen at a set pace. It's very, very clockwork. Like you just know, oh my God, I'm overdue for an event. I'm probably going to get raided soon because it's just been too long. You just know it's coming because it follows like a pattern. Uh, I don't have to say the person's name, but Fo Phobe, Phoebe, whatever, Phoebe, the Chillax is basically easy mode. It makes it so there are not very many events. When there are events, they're usually passive things like 40 llamas showed up or something and just eat things or something, you know, like things don't really, nothing too dangerous that tends to happen. Uh, this one's actually extremely boring to play as. But if it's your very first playthrough, this would absolutely be the best one to do. The first time I ever played RimWorld, I played with this one. And it makes it so nothing bad happens that often. So that way you have plenty of opportunity to just understand the game and slowly work your way through things. Uh, the last one is super hardcore players only usually. Uh, and also, if you're really bored of the game, it helps to mix things up. It's Randy Random. 
and basically events actually just happen randomly there is no rhyme or reason you could have 10 raids back to back to back to back even though the mathematical odds of that happening are probably in the trillions or something but there, it does follow a math formula as to how events happen but effectively things can happen randomly i've seen before of people getting four raids getting raided four times over the course of like three days uh or if, i've had people get like you know random animals show up like 10 times in a row type of stuff like it, it, crazy stuff can happen uh so this one will make the game the most interesting but as a new player it is uh guaranteed you're going to die guaranteed you're going to die unless you're playing on peaceful maybe but even then it's just tough uh because just the randomness of what can happen so if you're a new player again i would go with this one uh on your first playthrough and then on your second playthrough i would move up to cassandra classic and then play with this one a few playthroughs until you're really good at the game and then go to this one once you're bored and you know experienced and just trying to get more out of your money for buying this game all right so let's start with the chill axe one now there's there's different difficulties and if you're a new player just go with peaceful just learn how to play the game this game has very complicated systems that take a little while to learn and it's better just to learn them and have fun and then come back once you know and then try the harder thing uh you can also do a custom one which lets you change all these variables which you know if you know what if you play the game a lot you know what all these things mean or at least most of these things as a new player you're not really going to know any of this stuff so uh it's just better to just go with peaceful if you want to they can go through and try to infer what they mean uh but you would just turn like if you want it to be easy you turn threat scale off make so you can't get food poisoning make so animals don't fight back ever you can't get infections you can't get diseases like you, you can go through stuff like that no no random events of extreme weather uh predators don't hunt animal don't hunt humans when they get hungry like you can go through it if you want but just change it to peaceful uh, then there's uh you have to choose one of these is reload anytime or commitment mode uh, so the way this is, is you can save and load your game whenever you want. You can make multiple save slots. And that way you could like, if something bad happens or you're, you know, you spiral out of control, you can just load back a few saves and back like a week or two prior before things went wrong and then keep playing. Commitment mode is you can only save the game when quitting the game. So if something bad happens, it's it happened and that's the end of it. Now you can cheese commitment mode by just closing your game like Alt F4 or something like that. Uh, but that is like if you're gonna do that you might as well just play in relo reload anytime mode uh, you might as well like commitment mode is more of you know like even though you can't alt f4 uh it's more of you know you really are trying to make yourself commit to this you know you really like for me when i play nowadays i only play commitment mode because uh if i save scum the game's way too easy so like i want that extra layer layer of challenge and also i want the extra layer of person ability and Getting attached to the game all right so that's the ju gist of the ai storyteller part and why you would or wouldn't pick things so as a new player just go with this and then uh creating a world so these seeds if you ever played minecraft there's seeds and you can look up seeds but they really don't matter a whole lot they, there can be some cool stuff but it's 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 not really a big deal uh you can put in whatever you want and it will you know translate it to whatever code the game is using to you know simulate this uh and then there's globe coverage and this one really doesn't matter you think oh i just want 100 percent right like why not i have a 40 90 or something it, it doesn't matter it's, it, even if you had a 49 it's not going to affect it um because it's just a simple game but realistically at 30 percent, the world's already so massive you'll never explore the world even if with dev mode on picking five percent you'll probably never explore the whole world the world is absolutely massive like i've theorized before i want to make some time in my free time when i have time uh doing a playthrough of like you know knights who can't use technology and trying to eliminate all other like colonies on the planet even on 30 percent, doing that would literally take me probably like 2,000 hours that's how big this game is and i'll show you in a second uh, but you can adjust these parameters rainfall on low or high temperature is lower than normal or higher than normal uh population uh so that's like how many colonies and stuff there are there's a ton of other like colonies of tribes and things or there's very few and then the other factions this is default by default there are two high-tech civilizations one that likes you and one that tends to not like you and then there's a tribe that by default has nothing wrong with doesn't really care about you and is usually nice and easy to trade with and then one that tends to not like you now you can make the ones that don't like you you can actually send them things and make them like you eventually but they're high maintenance you'll have to keep doing that forever to keep them happy and then there's a savage tribe which is just tribal state they have spears and things all these guys have spears and, and bows and stuff there's a savage tribe that will hate you no matter what and no matter you can't give gifts to them they don't care they'll always raid you and always hate you pirate gang is effectively these high-tech civs but same thing they'll always hate you no matter what they'll come in with guns and rocket launchers and mortars and things 
Uh, and then there's mechanoid hives. There's these machines that come down every now and then and try to kill you, especially later on in the game once your uh, wealth is higher, which we'll talk about in a moment. And uh, they're, they're they're probably the hardest thing to deal with in the game. They're they're definitely extremely for new players especially extremely difficult to deal with. And then there's the insect gene line. So you know insects will come in uh, specifically when you're digging into mountains and stuff like that. Uh, so one thing that you can do if you really want to make it easy is you could turn off all of the ones that are uh, hostile. So this one I think is the hostile. Yeah, barbarity in them. So close that one and you could get rid of that one. And you get rid of that, 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 and that. And then uh, that will make the game literally like nothing bad will ever happen. There would be literally no raids or anything, I think. I, I think that's how that works. I know there'll be less and, and whatever, and you won't have to deal with that stuff as much, but I think it makes none. And if you hit reset factions, you bring them all back. And you can also add uh, more of them if you want to increase, you know, chances of these ones being spawned in and colonies and all this different stuff. Okay, so uh, once you've decided all that, rainfall is mainly for, um, honestly, I don't even remember why rainfall was good or bad. It's been so long. So it's, these things don't really matter. I would just leave all these things basic. And then you, once you randomize it, so you generate. And at this point, you're, you're not committed yet. It's going to generate the map. So you can do this as many times as you want. So it'll generate a world. And you can see now at 30%, the world is absolutely enormous. So in this game, you can migrate. So if I was all the way down here, I can pack up my bags and I can leave. And if I were to leave and I were to try to walk all the way from there, all the way up to the ice sheet, uh, I, you know, I don't know exactly offhand how long that would take. But based on my experience of the game, if you were running it at 300%, you can run the game at multiple speed levels. So if you're like three times speed, it would still probably take like many hours. It would take like an hour of your people, assuming that they had infinite food and could just go. It would probably take like an hour at 300% speed for them to get there. Like at least like 20, 30 minutes, which in time, in game time would probably be like three, four, five years or something. Like something just stupid long. So uh, the world is massive. So that's why you don't need a 100% world unless you have some crazy diabolical plan in mind as a veteran player or something. Uh, so now you need to know about biomes and what's going on. So yes, you can start on the ice sheet. If you start here at naked brutality, you die no matter what. There's like no food. There's nothing you can do. Uh, there are ways to survive. Back in the day, I used to be addicted to doing hard challenges in this game. And yes, I used to do one where I'd start naked brutality on one on the sea ice, one square away from the ice sheet, and then quickly migrate over before I freeze to death, mine up some steel, make a little base and a fire, survive, and live. And I did that before, and I actually went on and played the game and had colonists and eventually, you know, escape potted out and whatever. You can do stuff like that. It's pretty cool. But anyway, obviously colder is north. North's colder. South is going to be hotter on 30%. Uh, if you do 100% coverage, you'll eventually have a South Pole too, I think. Um, so you can look at some stats when you're looking at this. So this is um, down at the bottom left, extreme desert. This is normal desert. And then we have this stuff over here, which is arid shrubland, which is like the, you know, it goes from extreme desert to desert to arid shrubland. And then you get temperate forest and all these green ones. There's also jungle, uh, rainforest. Do not do rainforest if you are a new player, unless you turn diseases off. Because in the rainforest, even as an experienced player, it's unbelievably difficult to survive because of constant malaria and stuff like that. It's, it's horrible. Uh, and then there's, yeah, so there's a uh, tropical rainforest. There's a tropical swamp, which is even worse than the rainforest, I think, for diseases. And then there's temperate forest, boreal forest. And then I feel like I'm missing something here. Um, temperate, no, there's temperate forest. Yeah, that's it, boreal forest. And then there is tundra. And then after Tundra is Aishi and Sea Ice. And that is, uh, oh, and there's Cold Box. That must be newer. That didn't exist when I played like, you know, a year or two ago or however long ago, maybe it was, maybe more than that. Probably was more than that. Okay, so once you click one of these, you can get some more stats. So you'll see, let's pick uh, Temperate Forest, for example. Uh, I would recommend a Southern Temperate Forest on a 30% map if you're a new player. So let's start, say like right here somewhere on a road. So you see the bottom left, there's more stuff. It tells you it's a road. It's mostly flat. Not very difficult to move, and it tells you the average temperature range. Now, what you can do is you can click planet, doesn't really give you much information, and there's terrain, which does give a lot of information. So this will give you a lot more information. It tells you what stone types are there, which is really only applicable if you know what you're doing. Eventually, marble and granite are the most fun ones to have as an advanced player, uh, but it doesn't really matter too much as a new player. Uh, it tells you the elevation doesn't really matter. The average temperature, uh, which does matter because it shows you the range of temperature. So 55 to 91, if you're 
you know, using Celsius, uh, then it's going to be to show Celsius or there's, there's a mod you can get that will show Celsius and Fahrenheit side by side if you need it. But anyway, uh, so 55 Celsius, 55 Fahrenheit is what? Like, like eight Celsius or, or, or 13 Celsius or something like that. Uh, so what this is saying is it will never get below freezing outside of events. There's events that like cold snap events, but normal day to day life, it will never go below freezing. Uh, and in the summer, it'll never go above 91 outside of a random event that makes it super hot. So what this means is growing period is year round. You can grow corn and potatoes and strawberries and whatever all year round, which is going to make it the easiest to survive. Uh, it also has rainfall, which you can change that by going back and then uh, changing that scale around rainfall. Uh, forageability, there's berries you can forage. So this place has berries where uh, desert does not. But this, what this is mainly talking about is uh, when you're in a caravan and traveling across here, your people can forage berries and keep themselves fed without using your food. Uh, and different biomes have different forage ability, which makes it so you can't get as much while doing that. Uh, animals can graze here, yes. And then graze right now, yes. You can check at different times of year to see if it's different. And then average disease frequency. So desert actually has like the lowest disease frequency at the cost of being hot and hard to survive. And then swamps have a very high frequency and then uh, rainforests have, uh, or was it, was it, is this uh, temperate swamp? And then, oh, temperate swamp and top, tropical swamp. So temperate swamp has higher disease frequency. Tropical swamp has even higher, or rainforest is even higher. And then tropical swamp is like disease heaven. And it's like the hardest thing ever to play on. So uh, just pick a tropical, a temperate forest is always the best place to start as a new player and pick one that has never goes below freezing and never gets hot like this. And then once you do that, you are all ready to go. But like if you want to re-roll the seed, if you don't like the world that you see, you can go back and you can randomize the seed and then generate it again. Keep in mind, if you have 100% world size, it's going to be even harder. It's going to take forever to generate it depending on your PC. Uh, so now it's a totally different world. And now we would find a similar one. So I would just go down to like here or something. And uh, another good thing as a new player is to start in one of these mountainous ones, honestly. They're mountainous or on a road. And then the other thing to consider before starting is what other colonies are nearby. So here's one of the ones that hates us, tribal that hates us. It does, the hateful ones, it doesn't matter if you're near them as long as you're not too close. Uh, and the main thing is that you want to be near, if you're a new player, to be near ones that you can actually trade. So a good one would be, let's say right here, this one's neutral and this one's neutral. And then this is a temperate forest. So if I started right here or over here, somewhere near this road, uh, and one of these ones that's uh, you can grow stuff year round. I, the road you move faster during a caravan. So you can easily move to one of these. You can like send one of your people with some resources over to one of these colonies and trade with them. There is trading with other colonies in this game. That is a mechanic. So yeah, I would recommend picking a temperate forest near at least one neutral other faction. Just so you can experience trading if you get to play long enough. Just so cause it's fun. It makes the game more fun. So let's just start here. So then once you hit next, you'll get to character creation. I know this game just, it just keeps going, guys. It keeps going. We're almost done. This is the last step here with, with this. And then we'll talk about the in-game. So uh, with this particular um, game mode that I picked with the three colonists, you can go through each one and you can have all these people who are left behind. Now, the left behind people, you do not start with them. The only reason to do this is because they may show up randomly in your playthrough. Uh, it may just randomly have this person and have something about them happen with an event. Uh, you may be able to save them or something. Uh, but generally, the only ones you really care about are the ones that you can actually play as, depending on what you picked. So we picked the one with three people. So we'll go through each one, and then uh, you'll just keep. You can randomize them by default. I mean, there's mods that will let you randomize and more so pick what you want. But by default, all you can do is randomize. And every time there's gonna be, they're gonna be either male or female. They're gonna have a random age. And then they're going to have a random look to them that stays forever. The clothes can change, but the pawn look doesn't really change. They have a random childhood and adulthood backstory, which affects their skills. And then they have random traits that affect uh, their gameplay. And then there's certain things they will be incapable of. Now, some people are not incapable of anything. Um, but some people are incapable of a lot of things. So keep in mind with that. And then with all these skills, there's the different skills in game. Shooting is shooting guns. Melee is using melee weapons to fight people. Construction is building things. Mining is what you would expect. It's mining resources from like rock walls and stuff and uh, mining like steel and plasteel and different things. Uh, cooking is straightforward. That's cooking. And then plants is growing crops. Animals is tending to animals and taming animals. 
uh, crafting is making, you know, weapons and tools and different things at workbenches, uh, armor and stuff. Artistic is making art, which is effective for keeping people's moods up by increasing beauty scores of rooms, or also just making money in the game by making art and selling it to other tribes. Medical is a critical skill because when people get injured, uh, you want to have someone with high medical skill because then not only will they patch them up, I think they patch them up faster, maybe not, but the main thing is they patch them up better. And it's mainly effective for fighting infections because uh, the higher 10 quality you get on infection, the less likely it is to kill you is the TLDR of how infections work. Uh, social is for recruiting prisoners and tending the prisoners, basically, and also for trading with other factions. You get better deals if the person who's training with them has high social skill. And intellectual is purely for doing research and I guess drug synthesis too, which is you can make drugs in this game, but usually as a new player, it's not something you'll deal with too much. Uh, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things to know is this incapable of, there's two incapable of traits that suck really bad. Firefighting is a horrible one to be incapable of because fires are extremely deadly in this game if you don't know what you're doing. So you want as many people as possible to be, be capable of firefighting, not incapable. Uh, not being capable of art is totally fine. Um, and the other one to be worried about is being incapable of violence, which means they literally cannot defend themselves. They will not fight if they're under attack. They're incapable of violent. Uh, so they will not pick up a gun. They will not pick up a weapon. If you're under a raid and they're the only one alive, they will do nothing. Um, so there are a bunch of traits and different ones are good and bad. Super immune is one of the best in the game. It's in, like top five. Probably you're less likely to die to infection. It makes you extremely like, you know, less likely to die. Um, fast walker is good. You literally move faster. Then there's other ones like kind, which is good. It makes other people happier and, and have better social relations inside the tribe with the other tribe mates. And Miss is a rough one that you have to keep in mind because they don't like men. So they're less likely to befriend the male colonists. And then they'll get in social fights, get infections, beat each other up and stuff at bad times. I've had people get in a social fight in the middle of a raid when we're trying to fight people. Uh, bad things can happen. Uh, greedy is bad, for example. T taller can be good or bad. Uh, undergrounder has uh, pros and cons to it. When you stay inside all day, then uh, they're happy. If you have to go out, then they're not happy. Uh, or actually, I don't know if it actually works that second way, come to think of it. No, it doesn't stay that way, actually. Never mind. No, it's only a good one, I think. You just stay inside. It's not a problem. Other people, they stay inside forever. They eventually get unhappy that they've been caved up forever. Uh, and chemical interest and stuff is bad. It makes them more likely to do drugs. Uh, night Owl has pros and cons. It's always good to have at least one Night Owl who can deal with things at night and not get a, a mood debuff from it. Uh, brawler is a good one makes makes them better at melee combat, but worse at shooting. It's good to have a brawler or two sometimes. Uh, psychically hypersense is bad. There's random events that will affect your mood and it'll be, you know, make it worse. Uh, and then there's other ones that just don't have a huge deal to do with anything. Uh, great memory is insanely good because once you get over 10 skill, you slowly decay in that skill if you don't keep using it. So use it or you lose it type of thing. Uh, and then another thing I forgot about here is health conditions. And these will develop over time if you get injured in things. So this person has an injury to their leg, which causes pain all the time, which will cause a negative mood effect on them at all times. So that's a very bad thing to have. In advanced playthroughs, you will literally at times cut someone's leg off and replace it with a peg leg just to get rid of a painful scar. That is literally a thing that you will do in an advanced playthrough. So those things do matter. But as a new player, it's not too bad. Uh, Tough is one of the most OP ones in the entire game. Uh, this guy is extremely insane and steadfast. So he, he won't mental breakdowns as easily. He's tough. So he takes half as much damage. Uh, and this guy is good crafting and stuff. Like this is a guy I would absolutely want. All right. So enough with the rerolling talking about traits. Uh, so what you can do is you can name each one to make it more personable. So I could name this, like, for example, one thing I would like to do whenever I play is I'll pick one person and I'll, the middle name right there is what it displays them as. So that's really the name that matters for your day-to-day -day play, what you'll see. I usually name the first one after me and then pretend this is me. And then the other ones are like, you know, side characters in the story. Oftentimes the way I play is if the main character dies, then I quit, but that's completely arbitrary. You don't have to quit. Uh, you could literally have Donnie become the only person, get 10 new people, then Donnie dies. None of the original colonists are alive and you're still going. You, you can totally do that. But, you know, you, you could name Timmy and even though it's a girl, we're going to name it Jimmy. Uh, and then you could also give them their full name. So I, I, I don't know. Sarah Smith. So, you know, you name them whatever. Um, anyway, once you're all ready to go, if you are actually ready, you hit start. If not, you go back and change other things and change the seed and stuff like that. 
But at this point, we spent enough time explaining how everything works to you because all this stuff's important. That's why I spent so long is picking like what you do before you go in completely dictates how much fun you have in the game. So that's why it's so important to know what's going on before you actually start. But as a new player, if you picked all the options I went through in this, it's time to start. So what happens is you start the game, it loads it up, and then based on the scenario, it starts you whichever way. So for these people, um, let's see, you lay on the world, uh, lay around you, you have to learn how to make plans to survive. So stranded colonists, we come down these pods and we're stranded. And now what you can do is you can pause the game over here. So uh, I think I just be able to do it with space. I can't remember what it is now. So what we're gonna do real fast is hit escape, hit options and go to controls. Go to modify and these are the key binds. And uh, I already fixed it off recording, but there's one for pausing the game. If it's not set, click it and set it to space. It used to be space by default. I don't know why it was off, but uh, space is a good one for pause. So now you can press space and pause or unpause the game, or you can just click down here and change the speed. Uh, you can also use the number keys, one to play, two double, and three is triple speed. There's also a four times speed if you're in dev mode. So knowing the speed is important, you don't want to play at one time speed forever. It'll get super boring. Also, I just slaughtered Kyle on accident. Uh, I did something off recording I was going to talk about, but I uh, already just did it on accident because I was playing with settings. Uh, so this was Kyle. Uh, he was a Yorkshire Terrier, and he was the pet of, I think it was Jimmy? Or was it Timmy? It was Timmy. Uh, this was Timmy's pet dog. And so I marked it for slaughter. I was able to click it, and there was a button down here for slaughter, and I clicked it. And uh, then somebody came over, and they slaughtered the dog, which now I could butcher and make food or something. But since Kyle was uh timmy's pet dog that makes timmy unhappy so that's why we're gonna we're gonna go to pawns and how they work so pawns have mood food sleep recreation beauty comfort outdoors all this stuff so if your pawns get too unhappy they can have mental breakdowns which is the basically the uh, not the backbone but like the crux the crutch of every civilization is people having mental breakdowns is what will end your game oftentimes not always but often that can end the games so what we have over here is food. Uh, you have to keep people with pawns fed or they will eventually starve to death and die over time. And if their food goes, the bar goes below these two little notches here, it'll make them have a negative uh, modifier to their mood from being starving. So like a, one here is I'm very hungry. Another one is like, I'm extremely hungry. And I think even going all the way down might be the starving one. And then they're super unhappy because they're starving to death. Uh, and then there's sleep where well, they have to sleep. And if you ignore it, they'll just start passing out. If it goes below the first notch, it gives them a negative mood. And if it goes below the second notch, it gives them a very bad negative mood if they are exhausted. And then there's recreation, which is they need to do fun stuff every now and then, or else eventually they'll get unhappy and it'll give them a negative mood buff, debuff. Uh, and then there's beauty, which is just where they're at right this second. And if there's somewhere really beautiful, this bar will start rising. And if it stays if above a certain point, they'll get a positive mood saying they're in a beautiful environment. Uh, but if it stays in a negative place for too long, it'll be the opposite. They'll say, my environment is hideous. And that'll give them a negative mood. Uh, comfort, same thing. Uh, go too low, negative mood. Goes very high, give them a positive mood because they're so comfortable physically. Uh, outdoors, uh, so this is how much they need to be outside. Undergrounders don't have this, basically. But if you lock them in a cave for too long, it'll start going down. And they'll get a negative mood debuff on each one of these notches. And to fix it, just have them go outside for a little while. So that all of this is, while well, food is to stay alive, sleep is you have to deal with, but everything else is basically, that and everything else, is to control your mood. And mood, if it's above this first notch, they cannot have a breakdown. They're not, they're not gonna have a mental breakdown no matter what. Now, when this little marker goes below one of those, the bar will start dropping. And if the bar drops below the first one, then they can have a minor breakdown, which minor breakdowns are not too bad. They'll go and pout in their room for a day or something or they'll do something just minor. I think one of the minor ones was digging up a corpse and putting it somewhere, which sounds awful, but it's actually not that bad to deal with. Uh, it might've been a major one actually, but we'll see. Uh, well, I don't know if we'll see, but I, when I play again in the future, I'll remember, be able to remember. But anyway, uh, the next one's major. This is much more dangerous. A major break would be like, I'm gonna go beat somebody up. Uh, I'm gonna go, I don't know. I can't remember what all the major ones are, uh, but they're pretty bad. And then extreme break threshold, if it goes below that, there's a chance any every second of the day, there's just a chance that they'll have a major breakdown. Now, an extreme breakdown is a uh, catatonic state, for example. They'll literally become non-responsive, like they're injured and can't respond, and they'll just be like a equivalent of a sleeping person. And then they'll be like that for like, I don't know, three to ten days or something or longer, and you just have to feed them and take care of them until they snap out of it. That's a really bad one. 
Another bad one that can happen with extreme is they'll go on a murdering spree and try to kill somebody. Kibbles will be like, I've decided I'm going to kill Timmy and you have to try to have Jimmy try to stop Timmy or stop Kibbles or else Timmy will get killed by Kibbles and then everyone will be unhappy and it's a disaster. So things like that can happen. So mood is the, the crutch of the entire game. Keep, keeping track of mood is extremely important if you want to stay alive. If you don't take care of your pawns and that mood goes too low all the time, people will start doing crazy stuff and your, your whole civilization will collapse, which is why it's important to keep mood up and do different things like having food all the time and stuff like that. It's just part of the resource management and keeping things under control. So this is the backbone. Even if you do nothing else, just be aware of this because it's going to keep you alive or dead. Okay, so that's how pawns work. That's the basis of what's going on. Now, how do we control people? How do we do things? What do we do now? We have all this stuff around us, but we can't pick it up. There's these X's on it and stuff. Uh, if I grab this person, I right click it, nothing happens. So what we need to do is we need to go to this architect tab and we need to go to this zone tab. I don't know how people, like, without a guide, this stuff's such an like, awful thing to try to figure out. Okay, so you go to zone and you can put down a stockpile and a dumping stockpile. So the first thing you're gonna want is a stockpile. So take, click the stockpile, click and hold and drag your mouse in order to pick a stockpile. So let's just make a giant stockpile right there. Just let go and select it. Now you can click and you can select the stockpile and then you can click storage over here to see what things you can put in it. Now by default, everything's good. It has everything you'd wanna do. Your people can put stuff in it now. So in order to put stuff on it, uh, your, your pawns will automatically do it based on their work stuff and we'll explain that in a second. But if you want to manually do it, you can click upon and then right click and then uh, put the stuff away. But depending on what it is, there's other options too. But if it has this X on it, you cannot do that. So in order to get rid of the X, you'll have to click something and then click down here on allow. This will allow your pawns to deal with this stuff. Some stuff is marked forbidden by default. And that's when, when you see the X, you'll have to actually click and then undo it in order to allow it. Now you can select multiple things at once sometimes. Click allow. You can double click the steel, for example, and it'll select all steel that's on the screen. And then you can allow, uh, you can select all medicine on the screen, allow, or you can just hotkey it with F, which makes it really easy to hit F. So you gotta click and hit F, 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 and F. And now everything is allowed. My pawns are allowed to interact with this stuff. Now for hauling the stuff to stockpiles, they will do that automatically. But if I want to do it manually, I can click someone and then I can right click. Now that is not forbidden, I can right click it and I can prioritize hauling. Now if I play the game, you'll see that Kibbles rushes over to it, picks up a full stack and puts it on the stockpile. So that's how to manually force it. Uh, also to manually force putting stuff on, like there's this bolt action rifle. I can right click and force a character to equip a weapon. I can do the same thing for clothing, these flak pants. I can force Kibbles to put on the flak pants. And I could force Jimmy to put on this mega sloth wool jacket, for example. So you can force clothing and weapons and armor, like this flak vest, uh, by just clicking and right clicking. Uh, pawns may also equip clothing and armor on their own based on different factors like the work orders and stuff. Uh, but that is the basics. Everything's under control now. My pawns are putting stuff away. If I let this play out, they'll just start putting stuff away. But the reason they're putting stuff away is because of the next thing we need to talk about this game, the work tab. So the work tab. Now this may look a little complicated, but it is, but it's not that bad. So there's easy mode and there's hard mode. Uh, advanced players will play it on hard mode because it makes it way easier and better to manage everything. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can just leave it on this thing with an X and just it basically now it's, will they do something or will they not do something? So if I make it so nobody will haul and click these and get rid of the check marks, now nobody is allowed to haul anything. Now if I turn the speed up, they'll do anything but hauling. They're not going to do hauling because it's not marked. Now if I turn hauling back on, they'll all start hauling things. So that is basically how you're going to do things. Uh, there's doctor, like they cannot tend to someone unless it's checked. <coughs> they uh, have bed rest, which is when they're sick, they'll prioritize sleeping till they're well. They'll prioritize, you know, sitting down in the hospital bed waiting to get treatment. Uh, firefighting is something you should always have on. It's important. Now, what you really want to do with this is we talked about pawns before. You want to know who does what and why and then control their work based on that. So let's take a look at Jimmy. Jimmy, you can go to his bio and you can see what Jimmy is good at and what Jimmy is bad at and what Jimmy has a passion for. So this double fire means that he will learn this thing faster than someone else. And if there's a single fire, he'll learn it faster, but not insanely fast, but still faster. So you want to keep that in mind. So 
Jimmy is good at construction, mining, and research. So, and he's also good at plants, but he has a passion for these things. I, I definitely want Jimmy to do construction, mining, and intellectual. Because he'll get better at it faster and become a master at it super fast. So if I just force him to do all the construction, for example, then he'll get, like, leveled up extremely fast, and that'll be super helpful. So let's go to work, and let's go to con construct. It's already set good by default because of their traits, so it's fine. Jimmy's the only one who's going to construct anything, and that's what I want. Now, for work, for now at least, let's go to mining. Jimmy's the only one who can do mining, so he, it's already set, so we're good. Uh, we got plants on five, so Jimmy definitely wants to be someone who does plant cutting and growing. Uh, so he'll take care of plants, growing crops and stuff. That's good. And then crafting is a four, uh, and that's an important one, so I might want to check the other pawns first. So let's take a look at Kibbles. Kibbles has crafting ten. So I don't want anyone to touch crafting other than Kibbles, because he has the highest crafting, and he has a passion for it. So we're going to go to the work tab. And we're going to go to crafting, art, well, not art, but crafting, tailoring, and smithing. They're already set. The game kind of already knew. So we're, we're good on that. But if anyone else was checked, I would uncheck them. Kibble's the only one. Uh, so you'll go through this intellectual. So research, uh, Jimmy can do it. Uh, Timmy has it set. Timmy's good too. We'll have him do intellectual. So do research. Kibble's sucks at intellectual. So we do not want Kibble's wasting any time doing research because Kibble's is dumb as dirt and doesn't know how to do anything. So don't have him do research. Make sure that's unchecked, which it should be done by default if he's really bad at it. So you know, you'll just go through these things and you'll determine who should do what based on what skills they have. Now, if you want to get more complicated, what you can do is hit this one and get to the complicated one. Now, what this does is let you determine an order of operations on this stuff. So what if you're going to do this one, what I recommend is turn firefighter as a number one priority. It's always if there's a fire, go put it out. Don't do something else first. Go put a fire out. That's always the most important. So then after that, we'll look at patient. Patient would probably be also tied for number one. If you're sick, then you want to go and wait for treatment in case you're dying. And then after that, everything else can be after. Or you could even set patient to two. And then the other stuff, I usually set them to one and one. Like, don't go put out a fire if you're on the verge of death. Just go wait for the doctor to help you, you know, that type of thing. Uh, and then you'd look at, say, Timmy's the doctor. So let's see if he's good at it. He's okay. Medical four. So Timmy, since he's a doctor, uh, we want him to be on tied with these other things for doctor because if someone's sick, we want him to jump on that right away before they die. Uh, you may even want for the doctor to have doctor first and then firefight and stuff second. It just depends. And then you'll look through all these things. So Kibbles was the crafter. So Kibbles is going to have, after firefighting and being a patient, the next most important things for you to do are crafting. Uh, you can click or right click to make it go up or down, by the way. I, don't know, I didn't say that, but that's, that's how that works. Uh, and then you go through all these things and decide who does what. So Kibbles uh, has cooking at seven. So maybe at first I actually want Kibbles to deal with cooking and then turn these ones up. Or a lot of times what you may do is you might just turn everything off and then just decide what you want to do and come change it every so often. So I could just turn all this off and then just set Kibbles to cooking and then have like, if there's no cooking to be done, do some hauling. And if not, do some research, don't do anything else. And then once you get to a point in your game where these other things are available and you want them doing these things, maybe I'd come back and I have a different cook. I'm like, all right, no more cooking for you. Now you're going to be smithing, tailoring, and crafting. And if there's none of that, now you're going to do hauling and whatever. Or do that. If there's none of that, then go uh, do growing and do plant cutting. And then if none of that, do hauling and just don't do research. You, know, you can control things like that based on the numbers, priorities. And it's extremely important to do this long term. Eventually learn how to use the system because it makes your colony run much more efficiently. Super important to do all that stuff. Okay, so that's the work tab. I know that was a lot, but the, between the work tab and the needs and the bio, that is like the basis of the game. We've got a ton of it figured out now. Uh, so then that leaves us with a few other things that we need to go through. All right, so how do we make a base? How do we do things? So we go back to that. We, we select a pawn. We don't have to select a pawn, actually. No, we don't select a pawn, sorry. Architect. Go to the architect tab. And in here, there's tons of stuff. There's orders, so I can say uh, chop wood, and I could just drag and chop these trees down. I can click a tree and cancel that order, or hit C to cancel down there. Um, and also, I can see these trees, and you see this one's ready to harvest, so this is a good one. Chop it. This one's almost like fully grown. Sure, chop it. Uh, this one's not grown very much, so I'm going to ignore it. Same for that one. You want to go for the ones that are more grown, because you'll get more lumber for the same amount of time. If you chop down trees that are babies, they may not even drop lumber. They're only 23% grown. It's a little sapling still. So I can go to this one, chop this one. I can go to this one and say chop it. It's pretty grown. 
And uh, then my pawns, if they're set to plant cut, at some point, they'll go and they'll deal with it. Now, just for the sake of the demo, I'm just going to turn them off the complex stuff, leave them on the simple stuff. But uh, So at some point, a pawn who has plant cut enabled will go and cut these down now, which will get us lumber or wood or whatever, and they'll bring it back to the stockpile at some point, or somebody will. And then we can use that to make things. We can also use steel to build things and stuff. But we're going to go back to the architect tab now. There's other orders for things too. There's uh, harvesting, hunting, slaughter, taming, all this stuff. But for now, let's just build a structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a wall. And we have all the steel. And normally you would not want to build out of steel. But just for this demo, I'm going to build out of steel. When you click it, you can change what material you use. I could make a wall out of silver, which would be beautiful, but extremely expensive on silver. Uh, I could use wood, which is what I may want to do, although it's flammable, which is not good. Steel is also flammable, surprisingly, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, ideally, eventually, you'll build your buildings out of stone. But we don't really have stone right now. Although I didn't even notice this, we actually crash landed with some already cut wood as well. So I could select this and allow it. Now that I've allowed it, even though it's not on the stockpile, it is available for use. But the pawns will have to go walk over there to go grab it. So that's good. So we can make it out of wood. So we're going to click this wall, click wood, and then we're going to build a base somewhere. So let's say right here, we're going to build a base. So we're going to click and hold, drag down, like, say, three spaces. Then that's going to use 15 wood and a pawn who has construction will go and deal with it whenever they're available. Or you can manually force them to do it by clicking them and right clicking. I could click on Jimmy, right click and say prioritize building. They'll immediately go grab the wood and work on it right away, depending on certain factors. They may just build one at a time and you do some crazy finagling, whatever, but um, they'll work on it. Uh, another thing while I'm on this topic is you can do multiple orders of things. So I could, uh, for example, picking up the steel, I can prioritize or... I can hold left shift and then do another one and 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 another one. And then they'll do all these things in a row before stopping. They'll ignore their own needs. They'll manually do all this stuff and then get back to whatever they were doing. Uh, you can also cancel an order like that by just simply drafting them and undrafting. Drafting is how you get ready for combat, which we'll talk about in a moment. But back to the building. So we're going to go to structure, wooden wall. And now we're going to build more wooden wall over here. Let's say three. And then we're going to leave a gap because we need a door or else we can't get in there. So then we're going to build a few more. And then we're going to build up like this with five in order to close us in. Now, you don't need to block these corners if you don't want to. It actually will be fine. Although I think fire can spread between those corners. But we have wooden walls anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, so this is sealed in now. So now what we'll do, once they build it at least, you're going to click the door and build a wooden door. And click there and put the wooden door on that. Now, whenever, I think with Jimmy was the person, whenever it gets around to it, Jimmy will build it, or I can just tell Jimmy to prioritize it, and Jimmy will prioritize it. That's how we get stuff building. If a building is enclosed, they'll automatically put a roof on it. If you don't want them to put a roof on it, then you can put a um, no remove roof area, then they won't put a roof in this area, or a build roof area to force a roof. I could put a roof somewhere where there is no room, so I could say put a roof here, and they'll build a roof there. Roofs don't even use materials. Uh, but plants won't grow underneath the roofs, so keep that in mind. So you can do crazy stuff where I could have a hole in the roof. Uh, I could put a... Or actually, I could uh, ignore roof air, get rid of it. I could put a hole in the roof. It wouldn't let a lot of temperature out, but then I could grow a flower in that uh, in that area if I wanted to. So, uh, But generally, you're going to ignore those. Don't even deal with that because if it's a building, your pond will automatically think it's a roof area and they'll fill it in as a new player. That's all you need to worry about. All right, so... Really quick, let's talk about growing zones. This is going to be the backbone of staying alive. So growing zones is where you grow stuff, and the soil determines how fast it grows. So at the bottom left of your screen, you'll see this stuff over here. When you mouse over something, it tells you what it is. This is shallow water. This is mud. This is rich soil. This is normal soil, and this is stony soil, and then this is like granite and stuff that you can't grow stuff on. So stony soil, things grow slow. You don't want to do stony soil unless you have to. Normal soil is fine, and rich soil is ideal. So you can actually look around for patches of rich soil. Like here's one, for example. But you have to decide, is it too far away from my base? Do I not want them to have to walk that far? Uh, those are choices you'll have to make. Uh, for now, though, I'm just going to build a small little growing zone right here. Now, if the growing zone's overlapping with trees, they'll cut down the trees before planting things. Uh, any of that grass that's there and stuff, they'll also deal with before planting things. So I'm going to set a 5x5 five five growing zone right here. And then I'm going to click the growing zone. And I can 
um, allow sowing on or off. By default, it's on, which means they'll plant things. Or you turn it off, and then they'll stop planting things. And that's really important when you have your pawns planting things when they shouldn't be planting things, like in the middle of winter or something. And allowing cutting will let them harvest and stuff and, and cut different plants in the zone. But by default, you'll just leave them on. And then you click here to pick what plant you want to grow. Now, the way this works, if you've ever played Harvest Moon, is kind of like that vibe. Uh, rice plants grow super fast, but provide the least amount of food per square whenever they do get harvested. If you need food right away, rice will be done growing in like three or four days or something like that. I can't remember. If you just have many days. Potato plants are the in-between, and they also grow the best in stony soil, I think, unless they change that. And then corn plants take forever, like 15 to 20 days or something, but they give an insane amount of yield when they're actually finally done. They're the most efficient but they're also the longest and you have to really wait for them. Uh, so it's nice to have multiple growing zones with multiple things to keep things going. Uh, strawberries are ready to eat on the, on the fly, but can also be cooked, but they require higher plant growing skill. Heel root, you can find around the map, but you can also grow here in order to make herbal medicine. When you harvest it, it gives you herbal medicine. Uh, dandelions, daylily, and roses are purely for beauty. They're, they would be used to increase the beauty score of an area to keep, keep people's moods higher. And then cotton plant is to get cotton in order to grow, uh, to make clothes. So it's nice in the beginning to plant just a little bit of cotton so that you can make some clothes when things go bad and, and be able to, you know, fix up bad clothes. Uh, hot plants is for making alcohol later on. Cycoids for making cycoids or whatever, some tea thing that's good for mood but could be addictive. Smoke leaves basically marijuana. And tinctoria is brand new from, from the last time I played and I don't actually know what it is. The dye, I guess. Anyway, so for now, we're just going to swap it to rice because we want food right away. And whoever sat to growing will deal with this whenever they, you know, can reasonably deal with it. All right. So then we have another thing. So uh, combat. So in order to deal with combat, you can click on a pawn and click draft. Once they're drafted, this will work like a real time strategy game where I can move them around manually, have full control of them with normal just right clicking. And uh, you want to check the weapons. So Kibbles has that bolt action. Uh, and then Jimmy and Timmy don't have anything. I can go to gear to see what they have. Uh, for example, Jimmy has a, a Synthread t-shirt, a Mega Sloth wool jacket, and Synthread pants. And is currently holding a package survival meal, but has no weapon. So let's take a look at the bio. Uh, Jimmy can't even do combat, so Jimmy's useless. I'm not even going to control Jimmy. Jimmy can go work on construction. Timmy has terrible shooting skill, but is good at melee. Um, and I'm going to, regardless of that, I'm still going to make Jimmy or Timmy pick up a revolver because, uh, I don't want anyone to get injured right now. I'm not really looking to get injured. I'm just looking to demo. Now here's a bear. It would not be smart to fight a bear unless, uh, my people had better shooting. They're going to miss too much and, uh, the bear will probably reach them and then kill them. So I don't know that I want to fight the bear, but I could show you on something else. Also, there's some wood. I'm going to allow that, even though that was over there. Um, and then also there's these random plants. Heal root. I'm gonna, I'm gonna harvest this heal root. So when someone has a chance, they'll go harvest this and get us some herbal medicine, like I talked about. Just to show you how that works. Uh, but yeah, let's look at this squirrel. Squirrel's gonna be a little better. So let's turn the speed up. My pawns will walk over here. And now I can right click- well, I actually can't right click and attack a squirrel. If it's, if it's like a hostile thing, you can just right click it. But otherwise, you're gonna have to click attack and then click it. But when it's like raiders, you'll just be able to click them, right click them, I mean, and it should just attack them. But anyway, we're going to shoot at the squirrel until we hit it. And once we hit it, it may die immediately. It died immediately. Or it may get injured. So we can actually look at the health and see what happened. So what happened was its neck got shot off. So I guess it lost its head. Uh, so it says the body part's entirely missing. The neck got, is missing. Uh, Kibble's bolt action rifle bullet pierced the squirrel's skull, head, and neck to pieces. So we destroyed the squirrel's head. All right, cool. We have a squirrel now. So we're going to click and allow, and that'll allow us to haul it. And that is where we're going to want to make a dumping stockpile, specifically for bodies and the corpses. So we're going to put it over here. And what we're going to do is click it, click storage, and then don't allow rotten things, only allow fresh things. This will keep us from putting rotten animals on it and stuff. And then go down here, turn off chunks. This is for corpses. And then put corpses here. Now, in this case, for me, I'm making this as a butchering spot. So I don't want human corpses either. I just want animals. I don't even want mechanoids. Just animals. This is purely for butchering. So now, what I can do is undraft and tell Timmy to haul that. Or Timmy will haul that on his own at some point. So uh, now we have a squirrel. Now, if we want to butcher the squirrel, we go to production. And we would need to build a butchering table. Now, we don't have a lot of resources, so we're going to make it out of wood. And I don't know that we have enough right now, but we can do this. 
and we can press Q and E or we can click over here to rotate it. Now I'm just going to put it right here. It's just whatever. Uh, whenever it gets built, we'll have a butchering table and I can show you how to butcher things. So that is basics. If you need food and uh, you don't have any crops ready, you can go and hunt animals. Or if you want, you can look at these berry bushes that are ready to harvest and you can click harvest or press H and set them for harvest. And then I could tell Kibbles to go harvest all these berry bushes to get some emergency food real fast. Turn that speed up. And you'll see there are some berries, 24 berries. And then I can tell Kibbles to go and prioritize hauling that. Now we have some more food on top of what we started with. So that's how to get that. But ideally, we don't want to eat raw food, even berries. Berries, you're not very likely to get sick from berries, but you still can. And you don't want to get sick because that makes your person unhappy for a day, makes them vomit and stuff. It's just hard to deal with. But you ideally want to cook stuff, which we'll get to in a second. Also, cooking our food, it spoils eventually. Now, berries last two weeks, which is a long time. But if you look at the squirrel, uh, it rots in 2.4 days. Now, cooking with it will refresh that and uh, make it so it lasts a little bit longer again. And you can do that to kind of conserve food uh, by manipulating the game. But the main thing is meat and stuff rots super fast. And it also deteriorates from being outdoors and from not being under a roof. So all this stuff, uh, the knife is deteriorating. It's unroofed and it's outdoors. Steel doesn't deteriorate, but the medicine does. Uh, and the package survival meals do. So ideally what we're going to want to do now is make another stockpile zone and put it in the actual house. And now what we're going to do is pause the game so our people don't start moving things around. We're going to go to this stockpile and we're going to unmark things that can rot. So we don't want to put food. We don't want manufactured items. We don't want... Well, we do want raw resources, but eh, we, we probably don't want... Well, we don't want wood. Wood rots. Steel stuff doesn't. So we're going to go through here. We don't want weapons outside. We don't want clothes outside. Uh, building is fine. Like, whatever. Stuff like that's fine. And then um, we don't really want corpses either in there. So now we're going to go to this other stockpile. And we're just going to uh, uncheck. We're going to clear all. Get rid of everything. And then get rid of those ones as well. And then we're going to this new stockpile. We're going to mark all those things we want. We want the food. We want the manufactured. We want wood to go into here. We want items and weapons and uh that that's that's all that, that's good enough all right so now our pawns will eventually move items from this stockpile to the other one or i could manually tell them to do it now because uh it's uh whatever it's it shouldn't it's, it's if it's not even on a stockpile anymore also i forgot something over here uh we want to allow fresh stuff i had that unchecked and that makes it so they can't move it so there we go now i could haul it and there goes Timmy. He goes to put it inside. I can also expand these stock piles. If they get, you know, too much stuff and you want to make it bigger, I can expand it in order to make it, you know, bigger like that. So that's how that works. So now, um, I don't know if we have enough materials. We should probably cut down some more trees. But I want to set it up so that when we have enough material, uh, we have that wooden butcher table. But let's make a fueled stove. We don't have electricity yet. And that's something you won't get till later in the game. But fueled stove uses steel but let's uh put a fueled stove right here and that way they'll use some steel they'll make a fueled stove and then from there we'll be able to start cooking things so that's like the progression for the here of what you do and then um what you can also do so this butchering table it won't work by default what you got to do is hit bills add bill and butcher creature now you can set this to do it one time and just change it every time there's something to butcher or you just say do forever uh or you can go to details and pick what you want to um butcher and, uh, or you can do until we have, uh, something. I don't know if that works correctly for this one. I, I would say do forever. And now I can pick whoever is set to cooking. So nobody's set to cooking. We're going to set kibbles to cooking. And then we're going to right click uh, prioritize. Or kibbles will do it on his own whenever it's time. And so kibbles is going to butcher the squirrel. And now the squirrel left some light leather and some meat. Kibbles is bringing the meat to the stockpile. And there we go. Uh, also this needs refueling. It uh, looks like Timmy's on his way to refuel the stove. And the stove is ready to go. So now the stove, we're going to hit bills, add a bill, and make a simple meal. The backbone of staying alive. We're going to say, do this until we have, uh, say, 15, maybe 20 meals. Because we don't want to make too many meals because we don't have any refrigeration right now. They'll just rot. So you only want to make as many as you need. So we're going to make up to 20 meals and just do it whenever. So whenever Kibbles has a chance, he'll now go over there and he'll start cooking at the fueled stove and making us more food from the berries or if we had rice from the rice 
or from this other animal we just murdered, then, uh, you know, whatever. Make food from wherever, whenever. So that's food, we're alive, we're growing stuff, we have stockpiles, we are ready to go, things are moving along. So now we have a few more things real quick to touch on that are important for staying alive. Furniture. So furniture is important. We need a bed or else people get really unhappy. So we're going to put uh, wooden beds. So we're going to kind of just cram them in here, however, because we don't really have a lot of space. We're just going to put down three beds because we have three colonists. That way they don't have to sleep on the floor. And that is very important to keep them happy. Uh, otherwise, they'll get mood debuffs. Also, we would ideally want a dining room and, uh, you know, all this other stuff to make them happy, a recreation room. And the, all that stuff would affect their needs. Uh, so they'll build that whenever. And then also, we want recreation and start off, just make a horseshoe pin, just somewhere where those little three icons or four icons are not obscured with anything. And that will let people do that when they're bored. You can also make a chess table depending on your research level or poker or billiards or whatever. And that leads me, leads me to one other thing. If you don't have these, it's because you haven't researched anything. So let's talk about research. Research tab. So this is where you, re this is what you're going to research. You pick what you want to research next. Because of what we started with, we, with the one we picked, we already had a bunch of stuff. So say the next thing I would want to know would be, say, smithing. Or maybe I want, uh, I think smithing would probably be the smartest thing. Or a battery would also be good. Uh, let's say battery. Click it. Click research. That's now our research task. Now in order to research, you go to production. And you make a simple research bench, which apparently can only be made out of steel nowadays. Unless it's just got only wood available. Maybe it's got only wood available. I thought you could make it out of wood. Well, either way, um, you're going to make simple research benches. And then whenever the people want to, they'll go and research if they have it set in their work orders. And then they'll, you know, research and slowly make progress towards your next research. So that's research in a nutshell. I just wanted to quickly touch on that. There's wildlife shows all the animals that are on the map. You can zoom out and look around all the different animals. Uh, you can click it on here, wildlife, and click that to see where they're at. Uh, you can also have a sign tab to change different medicines and things and change what the drug policies are and stuff. It's kind of more advanced. I wouldn't worry too much about that in the beginning. Uh, and then there's animal tabs, which show all, all the tamed animals, which we don't have any. Uh, there's quests that'll come up from other civilizations and things. We don't have any of those right now. Be like, go save someone or something. You can click world whenever you want to look at the world map and uh, see what else is going on or zoom back in or just click world again to get out. There's these tabs. So there's the graphs and the graphs will show your wealth and show any messages and statistics and things. And then this is factions. See how you're doing with other factions, uh, hostile or you know, how hostile they are, how much they like you. And then there's over here back to the menu. Uh, so the one thing you need to know, uh, there's a few more things we need to touch on before the end of this, uh, wealth, uh, the higher your wealth goes, the bigger the raids get. Also, the longer you go without having a colonist die, the bigger the raids get. So if the raids get out of hand, it, you, like they'll keep getting out of hand until a colonist dies. So if you want to manipulate them, you can purposefully sacrifice a colonist in a raid, just have them die on purpose and it'll reset like some counter that makes the raids easier. But basically, keep an eye on your wealth. Don't get wealthy for no reason, or else the raids will just get impossibly hard. So wealth management is a thing. People will give away their wealth to other factions in order to build alliances, but also to um, control wealth. That's like a big thing in this game is wealth control. So that's important. It's good to know about that. And then also something else. I'm trying to remember what it was. Okay, something else that you need to know about. This will confuse the hell out of you is click it. Click health. And uh, you can tell what they can use. So can they only use herbal medicine? They can only use self care. They can doctor, but not you to use medicine. Or don't ever heal this person. If they get sick, they die. If a person can't heal themselves, like your doctor won't heal himself, it's because self tend is disabled by default. So uh, click that, and it'll let them heal themselves. Uh, so the doctor should always have that one checked, so they can you know treat themselves, which is really important. And you can also see how everything's going here and stuff. To reset operations to add a build, to harvest a lung or a heart or something and kill someone, or euthanize them by cut, uh, anesthesia installing legs and things and later on you can like get like bionic legs and things and install them in people in medical beds and stuff like that so that's also really important to know about oh yes i remember what the last thing was i'm going to close out on this last one the schedule if you wonder why pawns are randomly slacking and stuff it's the schedule and this is where you manually determine their sleep and work schedules so normally what well advanced players have their own different techniques for everything but say for example i just want them to work all day no recreation which is a bad idea then I would just set it like this. Uh, realistically, though, what you want to do is have designated recreation time somewhere. So 
Oftentimes it's best before bed. So even if they oversleep, it doesn't matter. And then you'll just set recreation for like three hours or four hours at the end, just to make sure that they keep their uh, recreational you know, thing up. Uh, so you can do this control things. Uh, one thing I'll do at the beginning of a game is I'll just set them like at the naked, whatever brutality one. I'll just set the person to work all day and then I'll come back later on and then I'll readjust it once they can or however, or I'll manually make them do things. You can manually control things like this, but it's not something you generally want to do. You generally want to get it set up in a pretty good, balanced homeostasis type of thing, and then just let it go. You can also control where they're allowed to go. Right now, they can go anywhere they want, but I could tell uh, who was that pacifist. It was, uh, was it Jimmy? Jimmy. But I could say, Jimmy, you know what? You're never allowed to leave the home area. Now, Jimmy will not be able to leave this designated area in blue on the screen, uh, but you can make areas. You can go to zones, and you can... Uh, expand allowed areas you can make new ones so i could make one and call it uh name it animals and if i had animals i could say all right change animals animals are only allowed over here and then i could go to animals just like i could with the people and then pick what areas they're allowed to go into you got to control movement and stuff where people go uh, it's good for raids have one that they can't leave the base if there's a raid going on things like that uh, you can also do that to remove areas. So home area is what they clean. So I don't want people going and cleaning out here. I don't want people cleaning any of this. I don't want to clean any of this. I just want them to clean the house. So you, the home area is constant battle because when you go to build something, if I build something, then uh, the home area will get expanded uh, to that area, which I'm actually going to show you real fast with Timmy. So Timmy, I got to put him back in unrestricted. And then Timmy is going to go and make the whatever, make this wood wall. Uh, okay, not Timmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. All right, Jimmy's gonna make this wall. And you'll see after I built that wall, now the home area gets expanded nearby that thing. I'd have to go and, and you know, remove it. So there's a lot of micro you have to do in this game. There's mods to change things and stuff. I have to click animals, click hunt. It'll make it so if someone has a gun and they have um, hunting enabled, then they'll go and they'll hunt the animal at their earliest leisure. And uh, there's also stone. You can make stone cutting tables, stone cutters table. And then uh, if I were to build that, I could put a bill for cutting the stone, cutting slate into chunks, and then making that into blocks. And then I could go and I could build uh, structures out of slate instead if I had it available, stuff like that. So uh, that is also good to know. Uh, last thing here, world, I could set up a caravan in order to do stuff. So I click on my own settlement and click form caravan. And I tell them where I wanna go. So I wanna go trade, I'd click that or right click it, hit accept. And then I would pick who wants to go. Let's say I take everyone and then I take with us. I want to take components and leather and dog leather to go trade. And then I want to also bring um, travel supplies. So I'll bring, you know, some of this food or something like that. And then I'll, you know, send them on their way or whatever. And uh, I don't want to automatically. Here we go. I can manually bring a bunch of stuff or I can bring whatever I want. And then I would send them on their way and then they would go on the map and then on the map and click them and control them however I want in order to change their path and stuff. But that's how you leave. That's how you go places. Uh, so just make sure you keep the rack up. Make sure you sleep, make your bedroom, take care of food and all this. If you watch this video this long, this video is probably like an hour. If you watch this point, now you know how to play RimWorld. You absolutely know how to play RimWorld now. I covered like everything, guys, of the basics. Now there's so much more. There's making electricity. There's nutrient paste. There's hoppers. There's art benches. Crematorium for corpses. Tailoring. Smelters. You'll unlock things with research. There's microelectronics. There's uh, making, you know, pulse charge munitions, bionic replacements. Then the star flight basics and getting off the planet in order to see the credits roll and to beat the game. Marine armor, recon armor. I mean, there's all sorts of crazy stuff. There's even rocket swarm launcher, which is new. That didn't even exist last time I played. So uh, multi-analyzer, ground penetrating scanners. There's all sorts of stuff, guys. And that's also why I said to start with the basic game because the game's already very complicated. If you're brand new, you don't want to start with one of the expansions. Start with the base game, learn the base game. Then when you start to get bored, that's when you want to jump on one of the expansions in order to keep your, you know, self-interested in the game okay guys i'm gonna wrap it up here i hope this video helped you out hopefully now you have a better idea how to play rim world uh also before you go uh if you want to support me or help me out uh check out the descriptions video below the first paragraph i have a link to a game that i'm working on called art gallery simulator and if you go and check that out and wish list that that would help me out a ton guys but this is my uh 2023 beginner's guide for rim world hopefully it helped you out now, if you're actually a newer player to RimWorld, hopefully now you have a much better idea of what to do to learn the game, how to learn the game, what game modes to pick for a new player, what to do. 
and just how to enjoy yourself playing RimWorld in 2023.